Hi all, for our notable game today, let's have a look at another amazing game of Robert James Fisher, Bobby Fisher, and this is one of his more memorable games. This was against Arthur Bisguer in the USA New York tournament of 1963. So Arthur Bernard Bisguer is still alive today. He's actually one of the oldest grandmasters still a little bit active. He was born in New York, USA, awarded the IM title back in 1950, the GM title in 1957, that's six years before this game. He was the closed US champion in 1954 and open US champion in 1950, 56, 59. He was the Manhattan Chess Club Championship winner in 1948, 49, 57 to 58, and it carries on, 58 to 59, 67 to 68, 68 to 69. He played in the interzonals of 1955 and 62, and on five US Olympiad squads from 1952 to 72. So he's the world's oldest active GM, and he most recently played, just last year actually, in the MCC Memorial Swiss in Massachusetts, September 2014. Incredible. So back in 1963, E4 was played by Fisher and Arthur, Arthur, pardon me, played E5 and we have knight F3, knight C6. We go into the two knights variation. So the two knights, not very originally named because both knights are out. Knight G5 going for that weak F7 and the classic gambit D5, which is thought to give black at least the quality e takes knight a5 check c6 standard stuff in this gambit line the bishop drops back to e2 and then we have h6 immediately asking the knight where to go if h6 isn't played immediately um then white might afford to reinforce the e4 square to give the knight more options than just f3 and h3 to go back to e4 potentially uh, so that's that would be quite interesting for white to have that e4 square as an option so usually the knight's kicked back and most often in live book the knight here goes to f3 and in in this game it's pretty interesting actually well it's it's almost an, a level amount of games in live book chess based live book there's 245 games with knight f3 and 201 actually with knight h3 fisher chose knight h3 and it looks pretty peculiar and interesting and it dates back actually uh to steinitz steinitz played this in uh some some key matches and it he didn't do too well with it so i think it lost a bit of popularity but it's interesting that the knight offers itself to potentially open up that g file and white does have the bishop pair of course if black takes there he's losing the light square bishop so black resists the temptation here to take that and usually players with black they they, they just move their dark square bishop either to d6 or to c5 here to get ready to castle in this game we see bishop c5 which is a common move and usually white plays d3 in this position uh, so d3 is most often played there's 47 games in my book and games could continue like this but uh, in this game okay we have casting straight off the bat and black castles now d3 was played here and yeah there's a temptation to double the pawns but a lot of players are just trying to re-centralize the knight here with knight b7 to d6. So is it so bad to double white's pawns? It's losing the light square bishop. Well, this is the, the sort of forcing move decision that was played by Arthur Bisguer. He played bishop takes h3. Instead of trying to like improve the best piece, that's a standard plan. So we see g takes and you you might think there's some attacking prospects on the g file but also with the light square bishop and no black counterpart with a light square bishop the light squares might be useful to white in the future you'd think uh, so let's see what happens but queen d7 immediately threatens to win a pawn now 
very interesting yeah white's a pawn up so if he gambits a pawn it will just be equal on pawns again and that's exactly what fisher did here actually he just gave the pawn back with bishop f3 and perhaps trying to emphasize light square control the bishop is is nice on this diagonal and seems to slow down any knight b7s in the future maybe if if the queen moved away uh it's it's protecting it the alternative here on queen d7 to try and protect the pawn it is actually technically possible to protect the pawn with bishop g4 and this position isn't too bad for white to part the queen here actually and make you know maybe later use the, the g file the, the queen's on on quite a nice diagonal but it's nice to be able to preserve the bishop and this this is a very interesting you know gambit counter gambit the pawn on h3 is taken and now after knight d2 it seems you know white's quite comfortable here although his pawns are slightly fragmented this could be a useful g file and this could be a useful trump card the light square bishop the e4 square is quite nice this knight still needs work to get back in the game it's a bit misplaced a knight on the rim is dim as they say now Arthur Bisguer starts playing playing some powerful centralizing moves in this position rook ad8 it seems very natural it's a semi-open file and it's almost as if yeah, x-raying the queen is some sort of cause of concern maybe related to e4 we see bishop g2 kicking the queen out it goes to f5 that's an interesting square i mean maybe e6 is also to be considered and now with this kind of x-ray and some pressure on f2 it seems as, as though the white pieces are kind of tied down a little bit the queen kind of gets out of the x-ray and protects f2 at the same time but also this move means that a knight move is discovering an attack on on the a5 knight we have rook fe8 and now knight e4 is a double attack on c5 and a5 but black defends both with bishop b6 so it's an interesting decision here but you see the queen is actually still not so comfortable here it's this rook x-ray means that maybe something to celebrate that pressure like knight d5 to f4 try and get rid of this pawn is giving the queen a hard time in this position so it seems overall although white does have this light square bishop and that potential g-file the prospects for using the g-file seem quite distant here or the light square bishop a forcing move in the light of knight d5 to f4 uh, seems to be useful here to white knight takes f6 just get rid of this this knight on f6 before it reroutes to f4 that's a classic square often the black side of Roy Lopez positions blacks often trying to use the f4 square and white the f5 square after queen takes f6 so though you can see that black seems to have a beautiful harmonious position with great d4 square control and white can't like move this point he'll drop d3 although white has the bishop pair the only problem it seems you know, which might be temporary is this knight it needs to improve location and the usual route in this variation would be something like this but here after king h1 black makes a slightly maybe a double edge concession move he, he blocks in his own bishop here with c5 with the idea to just reroute centrally the knight c6 to d4 but why not it's only a temporarily blocked in bishop and it might also come back you know to this diagonal later maybe so we see them smooth now queen c3 which kind of creates this pin in terms of f4 takes would double black's pawns with queen takes f6 so that seems to be quite a nifty move but the knight reroutes to the center and at this point black has done actually really really well after f4 knight d4 here the engine suggests black is doing well small advantage to black one problem also the rooks are so beautifully centralized in this position it's it's a very harmonious position around the d4 square it's almost like a dream position to have against fisher really and also there's the possibility that the rook entrance into white's position on the seventh rank a lot of games 
end decisively. When a player gets a rook to the seventh rank, it's often very decisive. The lateral pressure is often creating too much pressure to bear, and a tactical explosion usually ensues. So Fisher's often himself won many games getting a rook to the seventh, but it seems very difficult to do anything about this potential rook infiltration. Now here, uh, queen c4 is played, dodging the immediate problem also in this position that knight e2 would fork the c3 queen and the f4 pawn. So again, the queen is still not happy in this position, but finds a nice parking spot here for queen c4, which keeps a locking key against c4, keeping that bishop hemmed in and away from the knight e2. But black now plays a great move, queen g6, eyeing g2. So Fisher's in real trouble here. He kicks the knight so here the knight goes to f5 and it just seems as though a black rook is crashing down to the second rank it's very very difficult to try and, and parry a rook coming down to the seventh rank and of greater concern maybe immediately is king safety you know getting mated on g2 so this is a scary position that fish is in he plays f takes e5 here and after rook takes e5, he just basically accepts a rook's going to come crashing down to the seventh uh, rank. Bishop f4, rook e2. Statistically, this is a game winning strategy, just getting a rook to the seventh. And there's coordination here, there's pressure bearing down on white's king. So the immediate queen takes g2 uh, mate threat is parried with bishop e4. It's it's a very very uh, dangerous position. So bishop e4, but here uh, the defender of g2 is the bishop on e4. In this position, Arthur Biscu must have been excited with this rook on the seventh. And there's dynamic possibilities. There's an inconvenience to the knight being pinned here to the queen, but of course the bishop's kind of virtually pinned in defence of g2. And it's a critical position, a very, very critical position to get right. And perhaps black, concretely, if this was a correspondence game with unlimited time for both sides, black would seem to have rook e8 here with the threat of things like rook takes e4 and then mating, just get rid of the defender. Uh, a game continuation might be, for example, rook g1, rook takes e4, is a sharp move and here rook takes g6 rook takes c4 is winning for black winning material so in this position if d takes e4 there's a strong resource queen h5 bearing down on h2 and threatening queen f3 check so Queen f3 check has to be parried, rook a f1. And now here knight e3 guarantees black a good position. The bishop can't take because they're getting mated. So this, this is a technical line now I'm showing you, an engine line where white forces a perpetual check. If this was a correspondence game, it could end like this weirdly. But it shows the dynamic possibilities which are created in this position. Rook e8 would seem to be the most accurate move available to black. Uh, now on, on this on this line here, if bishop f3, then black might be able to take on b2 here. And okay, white sacking that pawn, but still has the bishop pair. So it's not the end of the world, this position either. But it's clear that uh, the idea of rook e8 seems the most accurate if analysis Great analysis is applied to this position. Rook e8 is the most accurate move. However, black played rook takes b2. And one advantage of rook e8 is also controlling the e5 square. Guess what Fisher plays here, which 
turns the tables basically to a position where black was slightly better to black is losing quite rapidly can you see what white plays in this position if i give you five seconds starting from now okay i gave you a slight clue about the e5 square bishop e5 although the bishop's defending g2 the rook is free to take on f5 oh dear oh no black's losing a piece he must have been gutted here he's losing a piece he had a great position a rook on the seventh and immediately after getting a rook to the seventh maybe he didn't play an accurate move and now he finds this pin is actually in operation to win a piece he plays rookie eight he's losing a piece rook takes f5 he plays rook takes e5 it's hopeless rook takes e5 and black resigned it's an interesting game and you might ask well why was this memorable <laughs> why is this featured in Fisher's memorable games black just blunders a piece right well black actually it's that moment of having a good position a rook on the seventh so one thing it says even if you get a rook on the seventh statistically yes it wins games but you've got to play with accuracy still there's things other dangers lurk in the position and here it was this pinned piece that danger was emphasized with white picking up the knight on f5 unfortunately from a theoretical opening perspective knight h3 is int intriguing quaint interesting knight h3 and the counter gambit is very interesting and i believe it has been used by other modern grandmasters like nigel short with success this is a very interesting line to play knight h3 getting if using the counter gambit the the bishop pair and the g file but it did seem as though black played a you know to a beautifully harmonious position at one point and c5 slightly double-edged in blocking in the bishop perhaps that's why there's there's some popularity more for knight b7 to d6 to keep this bishop uh, activated on the diagonal you can imagine g1 control will be useful in some of these variations so overall it's it's a fascinating game theoretically did did fisher really study the games of steinitz to, to pick up knight h3 possibly because actually knight h3 at that time in 1963 it wasn't really that trendy so maybe fisher ignited some interest in this opening line and shows you know he's a dangerous uh, player to play against even if you get a beautifully harmonious position a rook on the seventh you've got to watch out your bits they they mustn't drop off it's mundane to think about not losing material and loose pieces and pins but it's essential stuff to observe even if you position the outplay the opponents and it does appear fisher was in trouble in this game okay comments or questions on youtube thanks very much